Welcome back to History by Hollywood uh, and the second part of our examination of the 1978 movie Norma Ray. Uh, Martin and I are going to wrap this one up from here on in, won't we Martin? Absolutely. So this will be uh, episode 63 part 2 and let's go back to our synopsis and reality check. So it goes, like it goes, like the river flows, then time it rolls right on. And maybe what's good gets a little bit bad, and maybe what's bad gets gone. Okay, well, let's progress with the narrative then. Back in the movie, we see Norma Ray visiting Reuben in his motel room and asks if she joins the union, will she lose her job? He tells her no, she can't lose her job for just joining the union, but he's clearly delighted to see that she's, he's, he's finally got her on board. She's nervous, but at the same time, she's excited to sign up. Uh, then, at work, during a, a break, Norma, wearing a big TWUA badge, is trying to recruit new members. She's watched by one of the supervisors, who proceeds to not so suddenly threaten her. Uh, she visits her local church, uh, the reverend's outside, doing some maintenance work, and she asks that if she can, can she use the church for a union meeting? That's blacks and whites sat together, she tells him. The reverend calmly tells her that she's talking close to blasphemy. Uh, he doesn't specify which bit, and reminds her that this is a house of God so he doesn't want to buy in at all. She replies that she's hoping it is, and the Reverend will allow her to stand up and call for justice for all the local people. If he won't, she can't see any use for the church, and makes it clear she won't be coming back. He simply says, well, we'll miss your voice in the choir, Norma Ray. And then she replies, no doubt you'll hear it raised up someplace else. Then... Yeah, brilliant yeah, it's a great line. scene. It's a great line, um, that, isn't it? Yep. She just sort of ch chucks it over her shoulder, but she's so snappy and just... Yep, no doubt you'll be hearing it somewhere else. And I had, no, I had, like I it. had memories of Selma, where which is set prior to 1973 or 78, and uh, a big um, undercurrent of that story was that the civil rights movement was supported by uh, a lot of white ministers of various different congregations, and I was expecting this reverend to sort of come on board and be an ally for her, but <laughs> those those hopes were dashed comprehensively and very quickly. No, exactly. Um, we watched an episode of a, a completely on a tangent of a, something else uh, with showing um, British racists post-war where, you know, the, the British government went round the, the colonies and the Caribbean and Africa and basically recruited workers to come and work on, on railways and, and all sorts of projects. And, you know, standard thing, people have arrived who are not exactly like us, therefore we are going to threaten them. And, and there was a, a scene where a guy stands up at a meeting and and shouts. And there's this one clip of quote in the Bible about, um, yeah, is it Cain? I can't remember who it is, or Canaan or something. And, and this is the one that always seems to be used by people from the Ku Klux Klan and, and all sorts to say, no, this is the Bible justifying slavery or, you know, that, that races aren't, aren't the same and one has been put by God to dominate others and it's absolute rubbish but I, that's the only thing I can think of when he says you're talking close to blasphemy Norma Ray and I'm like well what do you mean blasphemy she's just saying can I use your you now you know it's not clear if he's talking about black people sitting next to white people or if he's talking about unions or what but yeah he's as you say clearly not supported indeed uh, okay so let's get back to the movie um uh, she's now, now clearly Norma Ray and Sonny are, are, are a couple, and they've got a, they've got a home of their own. Um, she's hosting the union meeting there, much to Sonny's disquiet. He sees all these black men arrive in their house, and he's not happy. Um, Norma Ray points out that she's never had trouble from any black men, only white men. We see Reuben in the house talking to the group in the uh, crowded front room, he, um, and he's asking them to speak. And, and, and complain to him or come up, open up to him. He's met by silence. It seems no one is too keen to start, but the lead is taken by a couple of the black guys and some of the women, so he's chipping away at them. He's, they're warming up to him. In Norma Ray's kitchen later, Reuben is despondent after they pulled in 17 workers for this meeting out of the total of 800 at the plant. She offers to drum up some more interest and go and visit people at the weekend. 
I mean, I, I think we've already said about the Reverend uh, him proving to be as racist as uh, anyone else, which shouldn't be a huge surprise. But then, as you said, it is worth pointing out that there were plenty of priests and vicars who were just as fervent on the reforming side of lines as those who were resistant to change. So, OK, so uh, I'll take us back to the movie. We see Reuben and Norma Ray going around visiting folk, helping them out with chores, if they'll just read the leaflets. And they're turned down by most of the people they visit, especially old folk who've clearly been brought up or conditioned to be suspicious of unions. At one farm, Reuben falls in a field muddying his shirt and he goes to a water pool with Norma Ray, who, who washes his shirt and then they have a swim. And she laughs at, him, laughs at him for being a fish out of water, a Jewish New Yorker down in the rural south. Back at her home, Norma Ray's convinced that her phone's been tapped as she rings around trying to convince fellow workers to sign up. And, and it's quite funny as she sort of trying to talk to the person she thinks is listening in on her phone calls. Sunny, her husband, is now getting quite annoyed at the amount of time she's spending on the union. They have a fairly big domestic row and we get the feeling that, that he's getting quite angry and maybe not far from violence as he throws things around the kitchen. But she gives as good as she gets, starts throwing things back and, and like she says, you want some laundry? I'll do some laundry. Just scoops up all these clothes and crams them in the washing machine and... So she gives as good as she's got and Sonny calms right down laughing and, and kissing her and this, you, you sort of get the feeling that, okay, yeah, you've met your match and, he, and he's quite happy to accept that. Did you pick up, did you pick up any, um, the, the, the scene where Reuben and, and Norma Ray are having a swim, did you pick up that there was sort of uh, a bit of sexual tension between them? I, no, I, I think throughout the, the, the movie there is a, platonic relationship between them that's close and I think I think the message is this is a woman who's quite happy to to sleep with a married man for her own you know self-fulfillment so happiness joy you know um, entertainment but actually I think it's really key that they, they you know I think that they admire each other whether they're attracted or not I think he he likes her clearly but he has a girl back in New York and they never come close to stepping across that line. Even, you know, the final scene when they say goodbye, they don't cross that line. But I think we're meant to get the idea that other people looking in might assume yeah, they are. That, that would explain it. Um, yeah, they, 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 um, but the, the, they make much of the fact of, the, of her p promiscuity in the film that she's got three children from three different dads which I guess to a 1978 audience would have been much more shocking than it would be to us you know when the film was released all those years ago it would have been a bit more shocking I guess than it is to our sensibilities yeah I mean the movie came out in 79 and, and that might be one reason why they set it in 78 to make it very recent and say to people this is still going on um, yeah I'm not sure and what I found interesting is actually Sonny's character, the husband, it doesn't go completely off the rails assuming she's having an affair, that there is some of that tension there. He's like, you know, um, but I, I think it's played really well. And in reality, I don't, there's not much, Crystal Lee Sutton hasn't said much about how close her relationship with Eli uh, Zivkovich was, but he, she was, uh, what would she have been then? Early, right in her early thirties, and he's in mid fifties. So it's a different dynamic to what we see yeah. being played out here, where you have got a guy who's, yeah, he's older, but he's only just older yeah, than her, right. I think. In fact, I'm not even sure if he is older oh. than her. Okay, so should, should we get back to the movie then? Um, sure. We're back at the back at work, back at the factory. Norma Ray, we see her handing out leaflets to her fellow workers, and she's asking them to go down to the Golden Cherry Motel where Reuben's staying so they can sign up for the union. Her dad is on a break and she asks if he's okay as his colour seems off. Her dad reassures her that he's okay and so she heads back to work. That night we're at Reuben's motel room and they're preparing more leaflets and paperwork. Norma Ray asks about his girlfriend back in New York and how she's so smart. We've heard that she's a left-wing lawyer. Books is Reuben's reply. She borrows one of uh, Reuben's books at that point in time, a, a Dil Dylan Thomas book of poems, and leaves the motel. It, Dylan Thomas is an interesting choice of, of this book. I, I couldn't find, again, anything that's to say that this thing of books and, and Norma Ray or Crystal Lee being exposed to, you know, poetry, whatever, is, is um, 
you know is any way uh, true or there's any basis in it. But I just thought the Dylan Thomas thing's quite quite interesting because he he was he wasn't you know William Wordsworth. He 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 wrote about you know real life and pretty grim stuff. And I just thought it's quite funny. Well, funny. I'm not sure if it should be funny, but. Uh, Dylan Thomas's famous last words in a famous last words article I once read, um, he I think he downed something like twenty five glasses of whiskey and said, "Gentlemen, I believe that's the record," and then died, which is just yeah he was a big drinker I think. And, uh, he, uh, and yeah. anyway. a tragic figure. He died very young, um, had a lot of potential, and was you know the hot young thing in the uh, last century. But uh, yeah, as soon as they say Dylan Thomas, you know you think of. Uh, tragic youth, wasted youth of a brilliant young man. So, anyway, I'm not sure if there's any resonance there with him selection, but it is interesting. Um, okay, shall we go on with the storyline? It's it's the next day, and Reuben arrives at a church for a meeting, but there is nobody there to greet him. He goes to a man called Warren and asks him what happened. Uh, Warren tells him that the bosses got the workers out on a stretch out, which means they're working twice as much for half the pay and by making them work a three day week. He tells Reuben to sell his, try and sell his union someplace else. Uh, at the mill we see Vernon, Norma's Ray dad, uh, he has a numb feeling down his arm and he tells his supervisor he thinks he should go and lie down. Um, the supervisor tells him he needs to wait until his break which happens in 15 minutes and not surprisingly Vernon promptly has a heart attack and collapses. We're immediately taken to his funeral, uh, where there's rain falling. Uh, then at Reuben's motel, there's now a bunch of people assisting him in turning out leaflets and lists. Norma Ray chews out one of the late arrivals, but Reuben tells her to leave the office and then goes and speaks gently to her at a cafe. She admits that she has a loud mouth, so she's got a lot of tension in her life at the moment and she seems to have taken it out on one of the fellow volunteers. Uh, but. Uh, but Reuben has treated her gently and um, things can move on. So later that night, Norma Ray is woken by two men in suits who are looking for Reuben. They're a bit menacing at this point in time, but we learn they're actually from the union's national headquarters. Reuben turns up to be told that he's not making enough progress. And the two guys from head office say they want Norma Ray to leave as they want to talk about her to Reuben. Reuben insists that, that she can stay and they can talk openly in front of her. They tell him that they're concerned that Norma Ray is bringing down their reputation. There are rumours, for example, that she's made a porno movie, she's had children out of wedlock, and that they're currently in a rural Baptist area of the South, and Reuben associating with uh, Norma Ray is not a good look for the union. Reuben then promptly blows his top and kicks the officials out. Norma Ray has sat it out quietly at this stage, but when the union men have gone, uh, she offers to Reuben that she can back off if it's not helping the cause. Reuben ignores the offer. So that's uh, a, yeah. a, lot, a lot in there. Again, uh, I, I, I think she, her reputation was tarnished by the mill bosses. Um, they did try and say, you know, are you going to listen to this, you know, unchristian, promiscuous woman? Um, there was certainly nothing that she made a porno movie. I think even in the movie they suggest that that's just a rumour that's been planted. They don't suggest it's real. Um, and, but I think Reuben's point is very good. He said it, it's all irrelevant. The only thing that matters is that you work at that mill and you need union representation. So, you know, again, it's fictional, but it's a useful device to let us know, you know, what's happening and, and to give us an idea of his passion for everything else is just fluff around the edge. This is the, the key message is about if you work at that mill, you need union representation and that's what I'm here to do. And I don't care about what you do outside of work, you know. Everyone deserves a, a defence, if you like, to go back to reverse of the fortune. Okay, so back to the movie. We see Norma Ray at work, and she's still being watched by the supervisors. We see her reading a letter put up by the manager on the bulletin board, warning that if the union moves in, it'll be run by blacks, and the blacks will be in charge of the whites. She calls Reuben, but before he can arrive, we see a young black worker being beaten up by a group of older white men. A few other black workers appear, and they rescue him as Reuben shows up and asks Norma Ray to get him this letter that uh, tells them that the blacks will be in charge. Get him a copy of that letter so they can take legal action at this falsehood. Uh, Norma Ray says she can't just take it off the board, so Reuben asks her to copy it down. We see Norma Ray standing by the board trying to memorise the notice, and then she goes into the ladies' room 
to copy it out. Norma Ray can only remember some of the letter, uh, but she, when she brings it to Reuben, he insists that she needs to go back down, copy it down word for word, but and she tells him that if she stands there in front of the board writing this, this writing the contents of this letter, she'll lose her job. But Reuben is insistent. Then it's the next day, and we see her standing in front of the bulletin board, copying down the letter. That, uh, at the same time, while she's watched over by a group of bosses who threaten her, telling her that she can't copy that notice, she carries on regardless. But is then summoned to a Mr. Mason's office, uh, and along with the other managers and supervisors. Let's go to my office, Norma. Why did you make those personal phone calls on company time? I want you all to spell out your names for me. Don't be foolish, Norma Ray. Mr. Mason, no one around here is on my side. And I'm not going to leave until I set down all your names on this piece of paper. Lady, I want you off the premises now. You phone your husband, you come over here and tell him to fetch you. I want you out of here right quick. Norma Ray leaves his office, but work walks over to her workstation to carry on working. Now the security guard then tries to lead her out, but Norma Ray is fuming. She grabs a piece of card, writes the word union on it, stands on her work table and holds it up above her head, turning around so that all her fellow workers can see her. They're, they're amazed at this scene. They stare and stare and stare until one woman turns off her loom. Then another and another and all the women at first and then all the men slowly shut the factory down and it's silent for the first time. The bosses of course are furious but it's too late. The workers have realised the power of unity. Norma Ray is ordered down by one of the managers uh, and the sheriff who's appeared. She demands her notice of dismissal in writing, a demand that uh, the bosses refuse but she is triumphant as she strides outside of the mill. Outside, she's horrified to see that there's a police car waiting for her and she kicks and screams that they can't take her to jail. Uh, it, despite her resistance, the men manage to finally shove her into the patrol car and she's driven away. So she's been sacked and now seemingly arrested all at the same time. Let's have an examination of that scene. That, I think that's a key scene of the movie, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's a very key scene in both the movie and the real events. And we can't really do a clip of the famous scene because there's no dialogue it's just or the, the only sounds that would work is just as you hear the looms slowly falling quiet but that wouldn't be very effective um there really was a notice pinned to the mills notice board warning that any union was likely to be dominated by black workers and therefore scaring the white workers into resisting any attempt to unionization eli zivkovich had heard about this notice and asked crystal lee to copy it down and she did so despite as shown, I mean, it's, it's incredibly accurate, I think, the, the portrayal in, in the movie. She did so uh, despite the close attention of several managers all ordering her to stop. So she finished co copying it, folded up the paper she'd copied it onto and tucked it into a bra, at which point she was not only fired on the spot, but arrested. She said to the uh, arresting cop, and she was a bit, she said she was a bit taken aback. She was thinking, on oh, what crime? And he said, disorderly conduct, I think it was. And she went, yeah, whatever, OK, I just need to get my purse. So she went across to her workstation, grabbed a magic marker and wrote Union on the piece of cardboard and just like the movie, stood up and slowly showed it around. And the effect was, was similar, that the machines were shut down and, and you know, a stunned silence enveloped the mill, both from the quiet machinery and, and the fellow workers. And it does seem to be that was an incredibly pivotal moment where the workers just realised, wow, they can't do anything if we all stick together, which of course is the whole idea of a labour union. Yeah, and and it's a bit it, it is a great scene, but it's a bit cryptic to write that one word instead of like unify or you, join the union or something. She wrote the one word union, and uh, um, later on, Crystal Lee herself said she wasn't quite sure what, exactly what she was doing, but in the moment she wrote that one word, and it did have the impact that the movie um, the movie shows us. Yeah, key scene as you say. Definitely, definitely. So, back to the movie. At jail, Norma Ray's told she'd be charged with disorderly conduct and told that she'd better call Sonny. But she says, no, you're right, I'll call my union organiser. Um, she's in tears about the loss of her job. Uh, Reuben comes and basically bails her out. He's unsympathetic. He says, hang on, there's been other union fighters I've known who've been beaten, shot, even killed. You just lost your job. 
So he's really unsympathetic. He's quite harsh with her. She gets home. She gets the kids up and says, right, I need to talk to you. She says, right, you know, both Sonny and I, we love you, all of you. And, uh, but I'm now a jailbird, which is, you almost sort of sympathetically laugh at that. And she says, you're going to hear that from other people. I want you to hear it from me first. And then she basically says, tells him, says to her daughter, your daddy died four months after you were born. Says to her son, your dad was a one night stand. I'm not perfect. I've made mistakes, but you're going to hear bad stuff about me. And I want to tell you the truth. Son is pretty unhappy because Norma Ray used a one call to call Reuben, not him. And she said, yeah, but I only called him because I knew he could post bail for me. So in bed late with Sonny, this is the one time we see cracks in his confidence in her when she says, have you slept with Reuben? She says, no, not at all, but he has got inside my head. And then there's quite a touching scene where he just sort of goes, okay, and he clearly believes her. And I think because she's so disarmingly, disarmingly honest, he probably knows her by now. And I know this is a fictional character, Sonny, but he's like, okay, I accept that, I'll support you. So the next day, well, I say the next day, we then cut to a scene where we see news reporters and photographers along with all the workers watching as a union vote is taken at the mill. The result is in favour of unionisation, but it's not a landslide. There's some 300 against and just over 400 in favour. Outside the mill, shut out, Reuben and Norma Ray hear the cheers and know they've got their result. Reuben asks Norma Ray to drop, in, drop him a line once in a while, letting him know how she's getting on. His car's all packed up with his furniture and... Oh, his furniture, sorry, with his, yeah, books and his, his packing boxes. And they say an emotional farewell. I don't say goodbye. I have been known to cry. Well, what do you say? <sighs> be happy. Be well. Same to you. Uh, best wishes uh, don't seem hardly enough. I, I'd like to thank you. I do. I, I thank you for your companionship, your stamina, your horse sense, and 101 laughs. I also enjoyed very much looking at your shining hair a shining face. Reuben, I think you like me. I do. I was going to buy you a tie clip or some shaving lotion or something, but I didn't know what you'd like. Norma, what I've had from you has been sumptuous. And they, as he drives off, we hear Jennifer warns again. And I, it, the, sorry, the song isn't called So It Goes. It's called It Goes As It Goes, I think. Um, but we hear that song again. And as the closing credits roll, the end. Hey. So, that's, uh, do you want to... Yeah, there's a lot in that. Do you want to, yeah. In, in reality, no charges came up from the incident on the shop floor, but Crystal Lee did remain fired from her job. Her husband, Larry, had repeatedly warned her that she'd be fired, and she was. In her words, mad as hell at the company, both for firing her and making her husband's words come true. Um, what happened next in reality was a long, slow battle between the increasingly convinced workforce and the increasingly entrenched J.P. Stevens management. It would take years for the unionisation to take place, at which time, as Martin's already mentioned, the TWU, TWA, TWUA had been absorbed by the ACTWU. Crystal Lee eventually won a wrongful dismissal case and went back to work for two days and claimed her several thousand dollars back pay and then quit. Uh, by this time she'd been divorced from Larry and met Lewis Sutton, uh, named in the Washington Post obituary as one Preston Sutton, uh, who she married and remained with for the rest of her life. She did struggle to hold down jobs due to a rep reputation as a headstrong protester uh, and forced her to move towns and industries regularly. She was employed by the ACTWU at one point, but even fell out with her union, quitting that job too. She spoke regularly at union meetings elsewhere and was a passionate supporter of unionisation and upholding or at least establishing workers' rights across all industries. Eli Zitkovich, um, he 
once said that in all his 20 years with the union, he never met anyone with her zeal. No, now, she didn't want the movie to use her real name, and as a result of this dispute, she got nothing from the proceeds, nor did she get anything from Hank Lieberman's book, which inspired the movie. However, after a lawsuit the studio uh, about the movie, the studio eventually settled with her for a $52,000 payout. She, um, yeah, she went from job to job. I mean, she describes in one article I read, uh, an interview with her, this chicken packing place. It just sounded horrific, the, the work. Uh, just really grim, and you're plunging your hands into ice-cold water where they fast-freeze these chickens, and, yeah, not, not, not pleasant at all. However, she did later qualify as a nursing assistant in the late 80s, and her last years were spent running a daycare centre in her own house. But a further battle lay ahead for this incredibly indomitable woman um, because she was diagnosed with brain cancer and she was denied medical insurance. Uh, it was basically her medical insurance that she paid into all her life, sort of said, no, we cover you right up to the point you actually become ill. And then they try to worm out of it. It was a battle she eventually won, but too late for treatment to be effective. And she died on the 11th September 2009, uh, fighting to the end. It, um, she would have been 69, she was 1940, so that's... 68, yeah, 68 she was when she died. Yeah, um, she survived by her children and by uh, Lewis Sutton or Preston Sutton, depending which article you read. I don't know if he had maybe a first name and a middle name, and it depend, depended who knew him as what, I'm not sure. But um, remarkable woman, clearly very, very happy to take on anybody, um, possibly... You know, after this early success, a bit like Erin Brockovich, you know, there was almost a suggestion after Erin Brockovich's, you know, big success against the, the water contamination case that she actually started, you know, I've got to do another one of those. And maybe was they weren't quite as uh, clear cut. Um, so definitely a combative one, but just strength of character uh, of Crystal Lee Sutton, remarkable. And there's a lot of articles you can find about her online from uh, union newspapers, left-wing newspapers in America, you know, and she is definitely seen as, a, as something of a heroine of, of you know, labour movies. Had you seen the movie before we took it on? No, I hadn't. No, I hadn't. And now, yeah, we're going to talk about our conclusions. Um, as far as entertainment goes... Sally Field's just incredibly watchable and I enjoyed watching Ron Liebman and their, their to and fro banter. I didn't find it gripping. Right. Well, I, I think she deserved the Oscar, I think. She was yeah. pl playing against type because she'd been seen as, you know, the frivolous TV star in in bubblegum roles prior to this uh, and she did a really good job but Bef a couple of two or three years before Norma Ray she did Smoking the Bandit with Burt Reynolds so she, I think she was seen as yeah she's a sort of you know lightweight comic actress and she definitely showed that, that I mean and, and as we've seen ever since with Sally Field she is really really effective I mean she as um, as uh, Abraham Lincoln's wife uh, Mary is it yeah, she was really, really good in Lincoln. And I just, yeah, I, the, there's something about Sally Field that I find very watchable. But the movie as a whole, I don't know. How did you find um, it? Um, I thought it was good. I enjoyed it. But it was funny, this kind of 70s movie. Remember when we were saying that uh, Bonnie and Clyde and the, the industry kind of lost its way a little bit. This has got no soundtrack at all. It's got mu mu a bit of music at the start and the end, but there's no none of that musical stuff to indicate how we should be feeling about it. It's pretty sparse. It's pretty pared back, really. There's no symbolism, you know. There's no backstory. It's just the facts as are being portrayed to us. And maybe that made it a bit less enjoyable than it could have been. I don't know. It was it was good. I'm glad we watched it. I'm glad it's on the list. It's an important character to know about um, in reality. Yeah. But, uh, well, what, what do you want to give it as a score then? You want to mark it down from entertainment, obviously, because it didn't get you right in. Uh, I, it, I'd be really... I think Sally Field maybe pulls it up to a seven. 
Yeah, I get... But it's not higher than a 7 no, for me. No, I think 7. I think that's that's being a bit generous of anything, but let's keep it at that. And historically, it's a hard one to judge, isn't it? Because they change so much. Uh, that the, the one key scene with her holding the union card, they got that bang on, didn't they? So kudos, Absolutely, kudos yeah, for that. That's almost perfect. The I, I'm not bothered about the name change. I don't think that's as important because it's clear we, we, we know who it's about and what it's about. I do think it's an important film and it conveys the message, but it does sort of indicate a happy ending and the really the, the, that was just really the start of the fight. Yeah. I think the achievement in reality was that Crystal Lee Sutton, or Crystal Lee Jordan as she was at the time, persuaded her fellow workers there was a fight worth fighting. Yeah. And that's when they started to. The actual success wasn't seen until much later, but I understand, you know, you, the, the movie has, needs to have a beginning, a middle and an end. Um, and and it, you don't want to leave a movie too open-ended because then it's kind of like, well, what was the point of that? I don't, you know, there wasn't a conclusion. Uh, yeah, it's really difficult. I think history, I don't think we can really go above a... Six? Six? Yeah, I'm with you there. Seven, six, six. Yeah, six, six, yeah. six. One thing we would like to ask everybody in conclusion is this is the first time we've used our new format of shorter episodes um, spread out. So this will be over two episodes. Um, do let us know how you find it, how you feel about it, and we will, um, you know, we'll take your comments on board. So thank you everyone for listening, those who, who've got to the end. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next time out which will be in two weeks time and the f no in a week's time yes and it'll be the first man we're covering aren't we yeah we're doing the first man which is the ryan gosling uh portrayal of um neil armstrong uh, uh, neil armstrong yeah and the, the first moon landing and that for that we'll be with you next sunday which is the 27th of october thanks for your attention and uh bye until next time yeah. along with astronauts White and Chaffee when fire swept through their Apollo capsule. But on that glorious day in May 1963, Gordo Cooper went higher, farther, and faster than any other American. 22 complete orbits around the world, he was the last American ever to go into space alone. And for a brief moment, Gordo Cooper became the greatest pilot anyone had ever seen.